Uh, resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Kootenay Columbia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am pleased to rise today to speak in support of the motion by my colleague, the Member for Timmins, James Bay. M-174 calls for the government to establish a national suicide prevention action plan with concrete steps and timelines. The government can and should take a leadership role in working to reduce the number of Canadians lost to suicide each year. Suicide has impacted my family personally. My niece, Mickey Everett, died on November 21, 1994. She was 15 years old. Her family still isn't clear whether her death was accidental or deliberate, but the impact her death had on all of us continues today. Her mother, Heidi, was never able to return to work. You never stop wondering why or what you could have done to prevent it. Mickey was a joy to be around. We took her on family vacations, and our kids adored her. We shared the same birthday, and my daughter Kelly honored Mickey by giving my granddaughter Lolita middle names of Michelle and Dawn in Mickey's memory, and we still miss her today. Her death was almost 25 years ago. Has anything really improved around suicide prevention since then? One area I believe we are starting to see some improvement in is reducing the stigma associated with mental illness. This is a positive step in ensuring that people feel more comfortable seeking the help they need. I'd like to read an excerpt from a column written by Anglican Reverend Amy Wundstert from Cranbrook. He shared how he came out on the other side of depression and offered advice for those who find themselves struggling using words of wisdom from a source you may recognize, Piglet from Winnie the Pooh. Piglet, said Pooh. Yes, Pooh, said Piglet. Do you ever have days when everything feels not very okay at all? And sometimes you don't even know why you feel not very okay at all. You just know that you do. Piglet nodded his head sagely. Oh, yes, said Piglet. I definitely have those days. Really, said Pooh in surprise. I would never have thought that. You always seem so happy and like you have got everything in life all sorted out. Ah, said Piglet, well, here's the thing. There are two things that you need to know, Pooh. The first thing is that even those pigs, bears, and people who seem to have got everything in life all sorted out, they probably have it. Actually, everyone has days when they feel not very okay at all, and some people are just better at hiding it than others. And the second thing you need to know is that it's okay to feel not very okay at all. It can be quite normal, in fact, and all you need to do on those days when you feel not very okay at all is come and find me and tell me. Don't ever feel like you have to hide the fact you're feeling not very okay at all. Always come and tell me because I will always be there. A piece of advice shared both by Piglet and Reverend Imey is knowing that you can reach out for help during times of crisis. We need to ensure people can both ask for and receive the help they need when struggling with thoughts of depression. Clinical depression is more than just a bad day. Depression can be persistent and can interfere with every aspect of life, relationships with family and friends, participation in hobbies, performance at school and work, and physical health. Left untreated, depression can worsen, leading to substance abuse, obesity, self-harm, or suicide. Despite recent efforts to reduce the stigma of mental illness, there remains much work to be done. Many people still suffer in silence, and three-quarters of those who die by suicide have no contact with mental health services in the year before their deaths. This statistic shows we need to do a better job of identifying individuals and groups at elevated risk and conducting proactive education and outreach activities to help prevent tragic losses of friends, family members, co-workers, neighbours, classmates and children. M-174 proposes measures that would improve our understanding of suicide and, in turn, our prevention efforts. These are steps we need to take because too many lives are being lost every day. According to British Columbia's Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, more than 500 people are lost to suicide every year in the province. Nationally, the most recent statistics available indicate approximately 4,000 Canadians die by suicide each year. That is about 11 people every day lost, and the circle of grief, of course, expands well beyond that. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for young people between the ages of 15 and 24. 
With each person lost, lives are broken, and we lose so much potential in our communities. Suicide is especially prevalent among men in rural areas. We need to understand the factors at play in at-risk populations to respond appropriately. Adopting M174 would begin the work of filling in knowledge gaps and establishing best practices. We also need to ensure that those who take the brave step of seeking help are taken seriously and have access to mental health services they need in a timely manner. One of my staff members in Ottawa lost her cousin Christopher to suicide last fall on World Mental Health Day. In the month before he died, he attended the local emergency room three times with suicidal thoughts. Each time he was sent home and not connected with mental health services in the community. He was 26 years old and wanted to be a writer. He was an only child and his loss has left a terrible hole in the lives of his parents. Christopher's story is sadly not an unfamiliar one as mental health crises are too often dealt with in emergency rooms, not equipped to provide the treatment people need. Canadians across the country continue to face lengthy wait lists while they're in crisis, unless they have the means to pay out of pocket for help. Barriers and delays in accessing mental health services put people's lives at risk, not only due to suicide, but to overdose as well. Canada is facing an opioid crisis, and many people who struggle with mental health issues fall into addictions after trying to self-medicate. The tainted supply of street drugs puts those concurrent mental illnesses and addictions at a high risk of death while they wait for access to treatment. One of my staff has a close family member who suffers from mental health and addiction issues. He has been admitted to the hospital several times following suicide attempts. The family has been trying to access publicly funded treatment services but have faced endless barriers and delays while his situation continues to deteriorate. My staff member says it has gotten to the point that every time her mother calls at an unexpected time, she is afraid it will be to convey the news this family member has died by suicide or overdose. The NDP has called for increased federal funding so those who are struggling from addiction can access treatment on demand. One important part of M174 is the requirement to conduct a comprehensive analysis within 18 months on barriers Canadians face in accessing appropriate health, wellness and recovery services, including substance abuse, addiction and bereavement services. It also requires an analysis within the same time frame of the funding arrangements required to provide the treatment, education, professional training and other supports required to prevent suicide and assist those bereaved by a loved one's suicide. While we work to reduce the number of Canadians lost to suicide, we also need to ensure those left behind have the supports they need to cope with the aftermath. Survivors of suicide loss face trauma and grief, often mixed with complex feelings of guilt, confusion, and sometimes anger. The impact of suicide reaches beyond the immediate family and can affect an entire community. One death by suicide is sometimes followed by another, and clusters have been seen among adolescents and in some indigenous communities. I attended the funeral of a Cranbrook resident who died by suicide. During the eulogy, we were asked to remember this person by their entire life, not just the few seconds before it ended. That was an important message, but without appropriate supports, it can be challenging for loved ones to process their feelings and navigate the aftermath in a healthy manner. And that's another reason why I support M174. It calls for an analysis of bereavement services for those impacted by suicide. One other group we must keep in mind in this discussion is the first responders who are exposed to the tragedy of suicide and must navigate interactions with families during an extremely difficult time. First responders are more likely to experience post-traumatic stress injury, which may elevate their own risk of dying by suicide. We must ensure first responders have training on best practices for responding to mental health crises and suicide and that they have the support needed to deal with the trauma that they face on the job. And we need to properly support all of our men and women who serve us in uniform, who are at an increased risk for suicide. As parliamentarians, we must do everything we can to prevent lives from being ended too soon due to suicide and the devastation it causes for those left behind. I commend my colleague for bringing forward M174, and I urge all members to support this important motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker.
The RO uh, Government House Leader has a point of order. Yes, Madam Speaker. I would just like to inform the House that Tuesday, May 7, 2019 shall be an allotted day. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resuming debate, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Indigenous Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on the issue of suicide prevention. And I'd like to dedicate this discussion, this debate, to uh, my late nephew, Zach Leger, who needlessly, tragically left us last summer. Uh, Zach, uh, we love you. I want to, uh, I want to first of all thank the member for Timmins, St. J uh, James Bay, uh, for bringing this motion forward. And I'm pleased to say our government is supporting the motion, which calls for a national action plan on suicide prevention. Suicide is a significant public health issue uh, that affects many Canadians of all ages, of all backgrounds. And on average, 11 people die uh, by suicide each day. Uh, that's about 4,000 suicide deaths in Canada per year. Uh, suicide rates are higher than the national average in many Indigenous communities and amongst all Inuit regions in Canada. In fact, suicide was the ninth leading cause of death amongst all Canadians in 2016. It's also the second leading cause of death after accidents amongst children, youth and young adults aged 10 to 34 years. And the suicide accounted for approximately 5,028 potential years of life lost in Manitoba alone in 2011. Uh, we know that suicide disproportionately affects certain groups. Uh, approximately one-third of suicide deaths are among people 45 to 59 years of age. Rates of suicide are approximately three times higher uh, amongst men than women. And women are two times uh, more likely to be hospitalized due to self-injury than men. In addition, suicide-related behaviors are reportedly more prevalent in LGBTQ2 youth in comparison to their uh, non-LGBTQ2 peers. Uh, rates of suicide are higher in remote areas as compared to cities and amongst people that are socially isolated. And as I previously mentioned, suicide rates in many Indigenous communities are higher than the national average. And in my, my home province of Manitoba, our, our Indigenous youth are five to seven times higher uh, uh, likely to commit suicide than non-Indigenous youth. Uh, and statistics, as stark as they are, only tell a part of the story. For every suicide death, uh, Madam Speaker, there are many more people impacted, such as those, uh, those surviving a suicide attempt or those grieving the loss of someone to suicide. Uh, this issue affects far too many families, far too many friends, and entire communities. And unfortunately, the stigma with mental health is that many, uh, many people with mental health or suicidal thoughts uh, never reach out to receive the help that they receive, they need. Uh, suicide is also a complex issue. There's no single cause that explains or predicts suicide. A combination of factors is often at play. Uh, this may include mental or physical illness or personal or intergenerational trauma, as well as experiences related to loss, to injury, to exposure to trauma, childhood abuse and neglect. Current evidence also indicates an important association between suicide and broader uh, socioeconomic factors such as housing, education, employment, income, as well as access to health care and culturally appropriate resources, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, the social determinants of health. This is why the Government of Canada is very pleased to support this motion, which provides an opportunity to build on efforts already underway to advance suicide prevention in Canada. Uh, su preventing suicide requires comprehensive approach, approaches with the involvement of all sectors, including governments, nonprofit, uh, indigenous organizations, uh, indigenous nations, and communities most affected by suicide. Uh, this, of course, is particularly important for indigenous communities. Our government is working closely with indigenous leadership to encourage and promote indigenous-led strategies for addressing suicide prevention in their own communities. We are also working closely with uh, national indigenous organizations to develop unique 
comprehensive strategies to mental wellness and life promotion. And in July 2016, Inuit Taperit Kanatami, ITK, launched a national Inuit suicide prevention strategy. This strategy outlines six priority areas. Number one, creating social equity. Number two, creating cultural continuity. Uh, three, nurturing healthy Inuit children from birth. Ensuring access to a continuum of mental health services for Inuit young people. Number five, healing unresolved trauma and grief. And six, mobilizing Inuit knowledge for resilience and suicide prevention. The Government of Canada, through Budget 2019, uh, will provide $50 million over 10 years and $5 million per year ongoing to support the National Inuit Suicide Prevention Strategy. Uh, but the approach and strategy developed by ITK may not be the right one, may not be the appropriate uh, solution for other Indigenous communities. We are currently working with the Métis Nation to develop a Métis Nation-specific approach that will be responsive to the needs of the Métis as it will be informed by a Métis perspective and Métis experience. The First Nation Mental Wellness Continuum Framework uh, was similarly developed to specifically address the needs of First Nation communities. Budget 2019 also committed $1.2 billion towards Jordan, Jordan's principle, and I was happy to join Minister uh, O'Regan along with uh, several other Winnipeg members of Parliament last week to speak about this investment and our government's ongoing principle to the full implementation of Jordan's principle. Through Jordan's principle, First Nations children are able to receive the mental health care and treatment that they require. This includes land-based activities, suicide intervention and prevention, counseling services, youth engagement specialists, and traditional healing methods. Advancing efforts towards suicide prevention, better treatment and recovery are important for Canada. We recognize the importance of comprehensive and culturally appropriate approaches with multiple partners to address uh, this uh, suicide issue in Canada. Moving forward, the government will continue to work closely with partners and stakeholders and be responsive to the diverse needs and experiences of people and communities most affected by suicide. We will continue to work together to build a Canada where we have a better understanding of suicide and its prevention, where everyone has access to the help that they need, and where all Canadians can live with dignity and hope. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Order. It is my duty to, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 38, to inform the House that the questions be raised tonight at the time of adjournment are as follows. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon West, Indigenous Affairs, and the Honourable Member for North Island, Power River, Fisheries and Oceans. Resuming debate, reprise de débat, the Honourable Member for Flam Flamborough, Glanbrook. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's an honour always to rise in this chamber and represent my constituents. On this occasion, it's no exception. Today, I rise to support a colleague from the NDP's motion, the member for Timmins James Bay, to establish a national framework to combat suicide. I want to assure my colleague that I read the motion line by line. I have no contention with the substance of the motion, although the complexity of the same is significant. I believe at committee, our colleagues can hash out how the execution of this would take into consideration the collaboration with provinces, our many First Nations, the Department of National Defence, etc. In fact, it would be my contention that this issue, suicide and mental health, are of such significant concern, a special committee should be considered. Only on one other occasion did I use an opportunity in this chamber to relay a personal experience referring more to the spirit of the bill than the details. I do the same today as I'm convinced that my brief intervention will add significantly to this debate. I do this also because of the overwhelming response I and my family have received from Canadians across the country when they've heard me speak out regarding my daughter's suicide and mental health. August 12, 2017, my wife Almud and I just finished having an enjoyable time with my son Lucian, his wife and our grandchildren at his in-laws cottage a few hours from Thunder Bay 
and we're aboarding a flight from Thunder Bay to Toronto so we could return home to Ancaster. As we were making our way to the gate, I felt my phone vibrate and I saw that my eldest son, Christopher, had sent a text to my phone saying that someone had posted an urgent message requesting to have Mr. or Mrs. Sweet, the parents of Laura Sweet, to call them immediately. Of course, this seemed bizarre, but any parent would agree that a message of this nature would immediately raise one's anxiety to a very serious level. Since we were at the time just boarding our flight, I asked my son to please call the person and press them for information so when we landed in Toronto, we could help Lara as she was living in Oshawa. We had been through a lot with Lara over the years. We had many great and positive family times watching Lara become a leader in training, aspiring camp counselor, and a total annoyance to her four brothers. But Lara had a lifelong battle with mental health. She was diagnosed early on with profound ADHD and we walked with her through many issues over the years with treatment, counseling, acting out, being arrested by police, searching for her at night on the streets and visiting her in jail. All this to say we were used to responding to urgent and pressing situations with Lara. Our love never diminished one bit through it all. I did not expect to hear from Chris until we landed in Toronto and told my wife that we'll get an update when we arrived at Billy Bishop Airport. Uh, to my surprise, while we're still in Thunder Bay, taxiing out to the runway, my phone vibrated again and my son in a text informed me that the person who is the author of the Facebook post explained that she was a neighbour of Lara's and that the police were at the townhouse where Lara was renting a room and Lara had passed away. I was horrified and it was hard to contain the immediate rush of grief, but I knew if I told my wife this information, particularly because I had not had the chance to verify the information was true, it would be the most difficult two hours of her life before we landed in Toronto. Hmm. Consequently, I decided to restrain myself, do the best act normal, and call immediately the Durham Regional Police when we landed, and that's exactly what I did. Hmm. I cannot tell you to this day how I contained myself, I cannot remember. The officers were still on the scene and the dispatcher was kind enough to transfer my call to the first officer on the scene who was thorough to ascertain that I was who I said I was and then informed me that Laura was indeed dead and all the evidence pointed to the fact that she had taken her own life, although it wouldn't be conclusive until the coroner's report was complete. Although he did tell me it would need to be seized as evidence, she did leave a note indicating that she felt she had let people down, she'd relapsed on drugs again, and needed to say goodbye. There have been a lot of difficult times, a lot of difficult things that I've had to tell my wife, Lara's mother, but I do not remember anything more difficult than explaining to Almut that Lara was gone. Lara was only 24 years old, bright, caring, lots of opportunity, and many people who wished her well and were willing to do all they could to see her successful. Now we had to face the fact and grasp the surreal reality that we'd never see her on this earth again. Speaker, having to go clean out your child's room where she was renting, notifying all who loved her and most reacted overwhelmingly with emotion and we needed to comfort them, planning our own doctor, daughter's funeral, finding the right photos and dress for the casket, and the list goes on and on, it was all so disorienting and a numbness is almost impossible to describe. Every call you need to make, and there are many, one hesitates, wondering what the challenge will be on this particular call. If you're calling the police or the coroner, you'll have to call and wait for the detective or the coroner's assistant to call back, and most of the time you're so immersed in other arrangements, you miss the call. The same goes on with other many calls and duties. You know you're running on empty, but you just have to keep going. Fortunately, amongst all the pain and sorrow and grief, there are amazing events. Us people of faith call them redemptive moments. Family and community comes together. We have a large family and a great church family, all who are there to comfort us and help us work through the journey of grief and loss. In Lara's case, there were hundreds of young people who showed up for the visitation before the funeral. Even though Laura, Laura struggled with her own mental health and wellness, she continued on in her Christian commitment and had touched so many lives with her love and compassion. In fact, there's a Facebook page today with memories of Laura. 
Speaker, it took months to receive the coroner's report so we could have any idea and confirm what had happened to Lara. It was over four months before we could pick up her personal effects, her phone with pictures of our last times together, her note that she left us months before. You question yourself over and over even though you know it's not healthy, nor is there anything you can do now that would have changed anything. Did I miss a subtle cry for help, she was trying to say? Did we reach out enough? Was I firm enough? Was I strong enough? Was I soft enough with my communication with her? Is there something we could have done earlier on in her life that would have led her down a more appropriate, a more healthier path? How much mental anguish did she go through on the way to making the decision to give herself a lethal overdose? Did she suffer? And then even months and years later, when your thoughts are not even remotely in the space of your lost child, a flower, a song, a color, a word will trigger what my wife calls a grief bomb. And the pain is just as real as if it were that day that the loss happened. Speaker, I share this painful and personal story to shed light on the importance of the initiative that the member from Timmins, James Bay, is asking the House to consider, approve, and undertake. 4,000 times a year, someone takes their life in this country. It is true that it's not always someone's child, youth, or young adult, but all too often it is. I wanted my colleagues to know that their important and thoughtful vote to, the mo to move this motion to committee for study could eventually mean that the pain our family endured and thousands of other families could significantly be reduced. A national strategy could bring together all those individuals and organizations that are already doing great work on the front lines to address mental health and suicide crisis. It bring them together to create synergies and best practices so that so many more people who are struggling could be helped. Thanks for the opportunity of sharing, and I ask all members to support this important motion so we can move forward and help people who are in desperate need. I do want to uh, thank the member again for sharing his story. It's, uh, it's obviously not an easy one, and uh, I think that there are many of us here in the, in, in the House um, that either know someone or have experienced it within our lives, and I can uh, sympathize with that. I've had an uncle, a cousin, a cousin's husband, a cousin's child um, commit suicide. And so I really appreciate uh, the tone in the House and uh, the stories that are being shared and the fact that uh, um, everyone here seems to be on the same page on the need to do something. <laughs> Resuming debate, reprise de débat, the Honourable Member for North Island Power River. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I too want to express my deep gratitude for the tone in this room. This is a very powerful and very sad discussion to have, and to be here uh, is a privilege for me to sp speak on Motion 174 that really talks about looking at suicide prevention. And we are talking about something that is often very hard for people to talk about. So I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the loved ones living with the realities of suicide, especially in the context of the speech that was just done before mine. The actuality of life when someone you love dies by suicide is simply unmanageable. I want to acknowledge that some communities in our country face much higher rates of suicide, Indigenous, communities, the LGBTQ2, and military and veteran communities, just to name a few. In February of this year, a young man in my family was successful in his suicide attempt. It has been devastating for our community of just over 300 people, our family, and most of all, those who loved him the very most, his parents, his sister, his uncles, aunts, cousins, and his grandparents. Suicide shakes the very foundation of the people it impacts. 
The questioning of how and why are overwhelming. It is something that most people are unsure of to, uh, how to address. I've heard of stories of loved ones, of those who have died by suicide, being completely isolated because people simply don't know how to go up and speak to that issue, to speak to that pain, and therefore too often avoid them. What do you say to someone who's lost someone they so love by their own hand? I have watched the struggle uh, in my loved one's father. The words seem to be blocked at his lips. We know that words have power and saying them aloud makes the reality that much more real. How do you carry this pain? How do you help? Who do you call? This is why we need a National Suicide Action Plan to help all Canadians, a comprehensive plan that prevents and provides support when suicide happens and to stop further suicides. Madam Speaker, each month on average the Canadian Armed Forces loses one serving member to death by suicide. As a member who represents a base in my riding, I think it's important that the members of this House hear this. It is an epidemic that continues despite some positive steps taken to address mental health issues in the forces. When Bill C-77 was passed through this House last, late last year, I was disappointed by the fact that it did not remove Section 98C from the National Defence Act. This section makes self-harm a disciplinary offence under the Military Code of Conduct. That concerns me deeply, as a member of our military could be having serious consideration of suicide, but feel unable to disclose or ask for help because they could be disciplined. What a way to come forward and tell this horrific truth about yourself. When people are experiencing a state that leads them to thoughts of self-harm, there must be a safe way for them to come forward. My friend, the member from Esquimalt, Saanich Sook, proposed an amendment to remove Section 98C from the National Defence Act in committee. Unfortunately, it was defeated, and the amendment was defeated because of so-called procedural grounds. This has been reintroduced in the House as Bill C-426. And, Madam Speaker, based on the feeling in this House, I really hope that this bill receives unanimous consent for passing at all stages when it comes to this place. When we speak to this issue within the context of Motion 174, we see the need for it to be addressed. We do not want any Canadian in this country to feel that they cannot come forward to get the help that they so desperately need. The Canadian Armed Forces deserve to have our support. The mere existence of Section 98C continues to be a barrier for Canadian Forces members seeking the mental health assistance they desperately need. And this House has only one more opportunity to fix this. I would love it to be this Parliament. Today, as we are debating the Motion 174, tabled in this place by the member from Timmins, James Bay. I want to thank him for his tireless work and advocacy on this issue and his dedication to bringing it forward. I am relieved, Madam Speaker, to hear that the government will be supporting this. I also want to thank him because this motion speaks to the isolation that I mentioned earlier. When people are successful in their suicide, when people attempt and are unsuccessful, for everyone impacted, it is often the isolation that is the hardest part to carry. People are unsure of what to say, terrified to touch the pain of that choice, regardless of the result. This outlines exactly why it is so important to have a National Suicide Prevention Action Plan. This issue of suicide must be addressed directly and holistically. The more isolation and silence there is around suicide, the more people will hide their thoughts and not ask for the help that they need. And it is imperative that Canada not leave any community behind. We must have a framework because there are many small and isolated communities like the ones that I represent with limited access to service. How do you reach out in a safe way? And we all know that when small communities face successful suicides, it can often become an epidemic. Mm -hmm. Madam Speaker, the young man that I spoke of earlier that was my relative is the second in less than a year and a half in our small community of just under 300 people. 
the impact on that community has been profound. And the fear that another child is going to follow those steps has been something we all watch. And when I think about the Facebook posts that we've seen from some of our youth who are actively questioning the validity of being here in this place, it is so important that as a country, we remember that those children, that those people across our country are so important and that we must address the isolation. And we can only do that by having a framework that goes across this country where we're working to collaboratively because nobody wants to live through this. And I think of my brother who has a serious mental health issue and how strong he has been in his life to face the multiple challenges and how hard it can be when he's put in situations where people don't understand that invisible mental health issue that he lives with every single day. And it worries me when people don't understand that and can treat him in ways that are profoundly disrespectful. You know, I think all of us know what it is to love somebody and often feel like you're fighting for their very existence. And I'm really happy that we're here to talk about this, to have a system in place to address that. You know, Madam Speaker, recently we're doing a study in the Veterans Affairs Committee where we are looking at the impacts of veterans and the use of mefloquin, which is a medication used to uh, prevent or treat malaria. Sadly, mefloquine has been identified as a medication that can poison the brain. There are many veterans across this country that do not know that they may actually have the impacts of mefloquine poisoning and that their symptoms may in fact relate directly to that. Some veterans have died by suicide and there are questions of is this part of it? Is it due in part to the undiagnosed impacts of the use of mefloquine? This also must be addressed, and that's why this is so important. Madam Speaker, I also want to acknowledge that I have not touched on every vulnerable community across this country that faces a higher suicide rate. Those stories need to be heard, and I hope to see all members of this House support this motion so that this work can be done. I'm very glad to hear that so many here are, but I think we need to make sure that everyone is. Currently, Canada does have a federal framework of suicide prevention. This framework does not provide funding, goals, timelines, and activities that will reduce suicide and does not assign responsibility to jurisdictions. And we know that if responsibility is not given, if jurisdiction is not given, if goals and resources are not given, the work simply does not get done. So, to Madam Speaker, I just have to say how honoured I am to be in this place when we're discussing one of the most difficult conversations. That in this house, we're all facing the challenges, but we're being brave to make noise where often there is silence. I encourage all of us and all of the people of Canada to remember to reach out to those people, even when it is hard and uncomfortable. Sometimes we just need to stand with people where they are uncomfortable. We have to admit that we are also uncomfortable, but know that we are with them, that we support them. And I think this bill will take those steps. And I'm really, really thankful that we're going to support it and that we're going to see change happen in this country. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Resuming debate, the reprise de débat, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you for the opportunity to speak about the government's support for Motion 174, introduced by the member for Timmins, James Bay. Put simply, there are few things more devastating to a family and community than suicide, as we've heard today from other honourable members and yourself, Madam Speaker. It affects Canadians from all walks of life and in all corners of our land, and every single day it takes 11 of them from us. That's about 4,000 Canadians lost to suicide every year. Our moms and dads, sons and daughters, our friends and neighbours, our teachers and caregivers. We also know that all too often stigma prevents people from seeking or offering help. At the most difficult moment in their lives, people need help and hope. We can and must do better, which is why addressing mental health and suicide are among our government's top priorities. I know how important this motion is to people who've been working for years to raise awareness, like Michelle Sparling, who shine out, shout out hockey tournaments, supports programming for youth mental health and suicide prevention, and Brian Sant Hansel, who started his Convo Plate initiative in memory of his son Paul, who died by suicide while a student at Brock. 
And I can't speak this afternoon without remembering my friend David Sheridan, who died by suicide. And, and his family's courage in speaking out. Sorry, Madam Speaker. And because they know that middle-aged men are at risk, and yet no one talks about it. Today, I stand before you to reaffirm our government's commitment to addressing this challenge head-on. I would also like to shed some light on the many initiatives, investments, and partnerships we're currently undertaking, including the federal framework for suicide prevention that will align with Motion 174. This is one issue where I can confidently state that I know everyone in this House shares the same goal, saving lives. Led by a Prime Minister who has courageously shared his own family's experience with mental illness, our government is taking bold, unprecedented action to bring mental health to the forefront. Two years ago, our government made the largest investment in Canadian history in mental health and addiction services, a groundbreaking $5 billion. This funding is going to those most in need, including youth, early interventions, and culturally appropriate services for Indigenous people. In 2016, we released the Federal Framework for Suicide Prevention with the goal of raising awareness, fighting stigma, and saving lives. Its purpose is to better coordinate our government's efforts to prevent suicide while complementing and supporting the important work being done by others. But what does this really look like? It's connecting people to resources like a pan-Canadian suicide prevention service that offers crisis support by calling, texting, or chatting 24 hours a day, seven days a week in English and French. This crucial service is supported by $25 million over five years from Budget 2019. Madam Speaker, the impact of suicide is not spread equally across our nation. Indigenous communities are disproportionately affected, including many where the suicide rate is heartbreakingly many times the national average. We know that colonization and cultural breakdown has had a devastating impact on these communities, with their lingering effects still claiming lives. In the spirit of reconciliation, our government is working closely with First Nations and Inuit to prevent suicide and save lives. We're investing more than $425 million each year in community programming to address the mental wellness needs of First Nations and Inuit communities. These investments are used to provide essential services to ingress, address ongoing crisis, investing in on-the-land activities, or enhancing culturally appropriate substance use treatment. Another group all too often affected by suicide are those who have already made so many sacrifices for us, members of the armed forces and veterans. That's why we have a plan to address it with the Canadian Armed Forces Veterans Affairs Canada Joint Suicide Prevention Strategy released in 2017. We also know that public safety officers and first responders have some of the highest rates of suicide in the country. Our public safety officers work incredibly hard to keep us safe, and their work can take a toll on their mental health. That's why I'm proud to see our government introduce the Supporting Canada's Public Safety Personnel and Action Plan on Post-Traumatic Stress Injuries. Our government is committed to providing national leadership to support the mental health of public safety personnel by providing coordination, facilitating co collaboration, sharing be best practices, and funding cutting-edge research. Madam Speaker, I know I'm running out of time here, so I'll, I'll wrap up just by saying that we need to be informed by those voices with lived experience, like those that we've heard today, and we will continue to work to prevent suicide. This may be a long, difficult path, but that it's one we're committed to walking, hand in hand with Indigenous organizations, other governments, community groups, and people most affected by suicide. Together, we can ensure every Canadian gets the help they need. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can save lives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, and I just want to uh, advise the member that there was nothing to be sorry about. This is a very emotional um, issue uh, that touches many of us, as I said, personal as well as within our communities. So really appreciate the uh, discussions being had here today. Questions, uh, resuming debate, reprise de débat, the Honourable Member for Calgary Confederation. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is uh, my pleasure to rise today to speak to motion M174, which has been brought forward by the member from Timmins, James Bay. Uh, the, motion, the motion suggests that the government establish a national suicide prevention action plan um, with numerous provisions, provisions such as setting up culturally appropriate community-based suicide prevention programs, uh, conducting analysis on a long list of subjects relating to suicide, and the motion also includes an annual reporting requirement to Parliament of implementation and progress. Madam Speaker, suicide. It is a word that has carried with it so much shame and stigma throughout human history. It is a topic we tend not to discuss, to acknowledge, or to deal with. It claims more lives annually than other more openly discussed issues such as motor vehicle collisions, homicides, or industrial accidents. Its relative absence from our common vocabulary speaks volumes. How many obituaries fail to acknowledge suicide as the cause of death? How many suicides get reported in the media? Not many, Madam Speaker, and perhaps because it is our fear of it, our inability to fully comprehend it. People who die by suicide or attempt suicide usually feel overwhelmed, hopeless, helpless, desperate, and alone. In more recent times, we as a society have opened up the discussion about mental health, but we do have a long way to go. Madam Speaker, just a few weeks ago, my hometown of Calgary was rocked by a suicide, a suicide that was reported by media outlets due to the shock and sadness stemming from it. It was a suicide of a nine-year-old girl, a nine-year-old girl. Our community was stunned. How does a nine-year-old girl come to this decision? It's something we just cannot imagine. When this young girl, Amal Ashtatiwi, took her life, we all wanted answers. Why? What would bring her to this point? Many of us believe such a course of action isn't even within the realm of a nine-year-old girl's thinking. It is something parents of young children want to believe isn't even possible. It turns out that uh, her story is not a new one. She was bullied in school, bullied to the breaking point. As a Syrian refugee, Amal, I suspect, already faced a lifetime of adversity just to be able to go to school. It should have got better coming to Canada, not worse. There are media reports that her bullying went unnoticed by teachers not because it was done in dark corners, but because it was done in her native language out in the open. This just highlights just another complexity in dealing with such situations. Amal's name translates into hope. And I know that this motion has been brought forward to Parliament in that spirit of hope. I know the member from Timmins James Bay is hoping to address the rampant rates of suicide among the Indigenous communities in his riding and across Canada. Sadly, youth suicide is a large problem within these communities, within so many communities. <coughs> I hope, we hope, that we can make progress in addressing the root causes of suicide. Once identified, we need to address the problems to reduce our suicide rates in Canada. As I read through this motion, I, and I suspect most others, would find little to disagree with. Suicide is a big problem. We don't talk about it, so people don't realize how big the problem really is. I recall talking to a, a police officer in Edmonton back when I was at the Alberta Legislature, and, and he said to me that there was, on average, of one jumper off the high-level bridge in Edmonton per week. He said it was a place for people in Edmonton to go when they're finally ready to kill themselves. It's one per week. Never reported, of course, in the media. It was a shock to me, the high numbers. And I'm sure it is a shock to many of us here. 
The city has since built, of course, a suicide barrier on that bridge, but more needs to be done than building the infrastructure. Every day in Canada, 10 people die of suicide and 200 others will attempt to take their lives. If that many people a day died in plane crashes, Canadians would be up in arms demanding government take more action. However, when 10 people die every day in Canada of suicide, when their cause of death is often unmentioned, when their cause of death is not up for discussion, then it is destined to continue. Suicide is one of the top 10 causes of death in Canada, and much of it is preventable. Men are at a much higher risk, well, sort of. Men are three times more likely than women to die from suicide. However, women are three times more likely to attempt suicide. And no community is immune from suicide. From the most remote communities in Canada to the busiest downtown street, suicide knows no bounds. The causes are similar as much as they are different. However, the resources to address mental health issues varies widely from our biggest cities to our smallest communities, from one, from one province to another, from one city to another. Like much of our national health care system, your outcomes will vary greatly depending on where you live. And I believe that that is just not right. Throughout Canada, there is already calls for more mental health funding, and this motion repeats that call. Throughout Canada, there are already calls for better, more culturally appropriate education and prevention programs, and this re motion repeats that call. And I can go on, but my point is, is that this motion does not call for anything that we have already not heard before. And I do plan to support this motion because I do not oppose any of its calls to action, calls often heard before. We certainly need to do something more than what we are doing now. And I'm sure that we all here do know of someone who committed suicide. Many just don't talk about it. We all know someone who tried to commit suicide, but we just don't talk about it. We all know more needs to be done to prevent and treat suicide. We just don't talk about it. And this has to change, and that is why I'm, I am very happy that we are discussing this here today. And I want those who need help to reach out for it, to demand it. I especially want kids to get the help that they need. The Kids Help phone line is a fantastic resource for young people needing to talk to someone. 1-800-668-6868. All parents should post this number conveniently in their house and speak to their children about it. It could make the world of difference later. Again, I will be supporting this motion any time that we can discuss and support mental health issues and initiatives, any time that there are efforts to raise awareness and remove the stigma surrounding mental health issues, I truly believe then that we are helping those in need. We just need to do more than talk. We need action. I want to also express my sincere condolences to the member from Flamborough, Glanbrook, for your great loss, honorable member, through the speaker. Thank you. Resuming debate, reprise au débat. The Honourable Member for Timmins James Bay has the right to reply for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, as always, a great honour to rise in this incredible chamber. And today is, to me, a day of great joy and hope as I see how we are coming together. And I see it as very telling because the very first emergency debate that this Parliament held was the parliamentarians of Canada from every region of this country coming together during the horrific dark night of the Attawapiskat uh, youth suicide crisis. And we came that night, and it was the first act of this Parliament, but we have unfinished business from that Parliament. And I think it's so powerful that we are here today to come full circle to say the deaths of people in this country from hopelessness, from mental illness, uh, is unacceptable at the rates that we're seeing. And what we've learned today is that suicide does not respect political boundaries. It does not respect the boundaries of faith. 
It does not live in urban or rural. It is not for rich or for poor. It affects every community and every death is like a psychic emotional shockwave that tears families apart, tears communities apart, leaves the bereaved wondering who and what they could have done. And out there, outside this building, there are activists and mental health workers and people who stand up and say there's reason for hope. And it's our obligation as legislators to join them in making sure that we have a framework. Because we know that frameworks and action plans work. We can look to Quebec. Quebec is a world model. They dropped the youth suicide rate by 50 percent. Imagine what that would mean in the rest of this country. That in ITK we have now a suicide plan. Well, we should have a national one. That we are bringing a suicide plan to respond for the military, which we need. What we need is it for everyone. And I want to say, Madam Speaker, uh, earlier in this winter, I was in Thunder Bay and I got a call at 11 o'clock at night to go to a hotel uh, and saw Mamakwa, the provincial member, said, can you come with me? And there had been a death of a 14-year-old girl. And I didn't know the community, but he said, can you come and pay respect? Mm -hmm. And it was the whole third floor of the hotel. And we came up, we had to give our condolences. And we started from the classmates and the neighbors and the third cousins and the second cousins down to the family members then to finally walk in that room at the moment they were talking about taking that little girl's body home from the airport or from the hospital and we tried to give our condolences and the only thing they could say is we've lost so many how is it possible that a country with as much resources and as much hope and as much skill as Canada can leave its young to die? That is a question that we as parliamentarians need to respond. That we aren't just there to say sorry, sorry for your loss, but to say your child, your husband, your cousin was loved. They just weren't sure that they were loved. And we can love them as a society and we can love them as individuals, but as a nation, we have the obligation to put in place the tools to make sure that when they are hopeless, when they are in their darkest hour, that if they make that call, there will be the support. If they're looking for those resources, it will be there. And that we as parliamentarians are tracking where are the hotspots, where are the danger points, so that we can start to move in and put the resources on the ground. Because this is what we learned in Attawapiskat, and we learned it in the Skandiga, and we learned it in so many of the other communities. It's not good enough to wait until the crisis hits. Proactive engagement, working with communities across this country gives people a sense that their lives have meaning, their lives have dignity, and they will not take that dark path. That is the opportunity before this parliament. And for all, for all the smut and corruption that we debate on a daily basis, I would say to have begun this parliament talking about this issue and to have ended this parliament trying to make a change, we can go home and say, for all the other things we failed on, on this one, we all came together and it's going to make a difference. Thank you, Miigwech. Honored.